set of very complex shot. I mean, just the weight of the technique of cinema was just unbearable. I, I just got to a point, I just hated it, could not stand it anymore, and I had to invent a different way to make movies for myself. Olivia Asayas came under my radar when Personal Shopper was released back in 2017. I went to the theater and walked out pretty much like everyone else who just saw the film. Confused. This piqued my interest ever since I have Asayas under my radar in hopes of one day I can have the time to dig in and find more hidden gems in his filmography, the ones that I consider to be in the same category of Personal Shopper, which never left my mind in the past three years. Films so offbeat to which they linger pretty much years after its release. Fast forward to 2020 when I started the Spotlight series, Asayas naturally rang the bell once again. So over the course of roughly a month, I took the time and watched most of Asayas' films, that is everything that I could find because there are also a few films that are lost and I couldn't find them anywhere. And after hours spending watching his films, thinking about them, I am surprised to say that Personal Shopper 100% does not embody Asayas as an artist at all. This is a guy who made so many films in his career, there's bound to be hits and misses, there's bound to be stylistic differences. If you ask me to describe or pitch Asayas as a filmmaker, it would be unreasonably difficult to do so. And that's exactly why I'm taking a different approach to this video. So for the fifth episode of The Spotlight, I want to take a look at Asayas' filmography, which spans over the course of some 30 years, how his approach shifts over the decades, and some common themes he explored regardless of genre. This is Olivier Asayas, Radicality Naked. No spoiler, of course. When looking at Asayas' work from top to bottom, there's easily as many ways you can group and categorize them as any other person would from different angles. I'd even shuffle the 15 films I've watched around just to see which fits the best. And for part one, I think it's safe to say all of these are related to coming of age or a person's growth. From the 1989 Winter's Child and 1994 Cold Water to the 1999 Late August, Early September, and the more recent Something in the Air from 2013. In this chapter, Asayas dove deep into the struggle of growing up during the 70s and how the political status of the world influenced the people. They don't necessarily depict teenagers and childhood so much as adults navigating through life is fair game. Cold Water and Something in the Air, which many, including myself, consider them to be companion pieces even though they released almost 20 years apart from each other, both of which are autobiographical, reflecting upon Asayas' early life in France, where they stirred up trouble like shoplifting and graffiti under a politically unresting backdrop. They are considered by me to be minimalistic, where the line between everything happening and not happening is extremely blurred. In other words, Asayas captured a time frame and an emotion rather than a plot driven narrative. For example, if you condense everything that happened in cold water, it would probably only equate to some 10 pages of screenplay. Late August, early September, and Winter's Child follow groups of adults instead of teenagers, showing the constant struggle life has to offer in regards to human relationship and self-worth. To put them into plainer words, it is about a group of adults not acting like adults because they don't know how to be one yet. Winter's Child is about a love quadrangle, and late August, early September is a group of friends and lovers figuring their shit out. This chapter is more egotistic, it is more introspective, and it is also more vulnerable and isolated. That is until the next chapter. I put Demon Lover 2003, Boarding Gate 2008, and Irma Vid 1996 in one group because of the fetish of control, whether that's coming from creativity or sexuality. It explores how people's obsession of one thing can often lead to catastrophe. This disorientating feel that this chapter manifests is something quite hard to describe to a point where they are pretty much narratively incomprehensible. Demon Lover covers an executive party trying to take control over a booming porn company in Japan. It deals with desensitization and violence through consumptions. It sparked a lot of conversation at the time because of its disturbing images and that striking ending that concluded the film, Boarding Gate covers a secret underground drug trade through an abused victim, and Irma Vep depicts a foreign actor as a sex object in the eyes of the natives. 
one of whom the director slowly loses his mind over the creation of something great. Asias realized the idea of losing control over something into a techno sounding mess on screen, in which he emphasizes on the power dynamic people have with one another. Whether it's an underappreciated employee, or a rape victim. This is the chapter I find the most difficult to sit through purely from how dirty these pieces could be. However, it is a relatively small part of Asaiz's career. When you speak reborn in regards to Asaiz to me, there may be two options, the theme of which the films constitute or the actual revitalization of an artist. In this case, is definitely the former. Characters who want something more than wealth, characters who strive to leave a revolution through violence, characters who stuck in the past and cannot keep up with the modern current, and characters who try to get clean for the future generation. In this chapter, the world is dirty, and the people within either try to change or be consumed by it. Sentimental Destinies, Carlos, and Wasp Network are very research based. It's more so about Asaias throwing all these facts at you just to see how you will react. Sentimental Destinies covers decades of family drama in a world of a porcelain empire. Carlos documents the infamous terrorist Carlos the Jackal's rise and fall. And Wasp Network tells the true story of Cuban spies in American territory during the 1990s. Spilling over to the most recent non fiction, which is about a group of artists struggling to keep up with modernity. And last Lastly, Clean follows a drug addict who tries to reunite with her son. Through the eyes of these characters, the world is holding them hostage. This may come from political reasonings, for technological reasonings, or even environmental reasonings. It would be a stretch to say the same with the characters in Sentimental Destinies, but they are very privileged in a way that's forcing them to be shallow. But what I'm trying to say here is the rebirth of characters, characters who went into the woods and came out the other end. Yet the very revitalization is never as interesting as, say, death. With this particular way of grouping, this section is easily my favorite of the four. It covers midlife and existential crisis, materialism, identity, loss, and grief. Clouds of Seals Maria is about a middle aged actor who is a bit out of touch, getting a challenging role to play after the death of her previous co worker. The film explores her being stuck in her way, not being able to look past her past, and the disconnectedness between her own identity and time itself. The way Asais went about those themes through natural phenomenon, a play, and a moment by the end of Act 2, which is, in my opinion, one of the best Asais moments in his entire filmography. Summer Hours, on the other end, talks about material possession whether when someone close to you passes, do you still carry on with them? Are memories something that live within you, or do they lie on something else? Does death symbolize the end, or does it also symbolize an inception of something else? Personal Shopper, lastly, deals with grief and death. It blends a lot of genres and elements to complete. It is a devastating film with I think the best Asaias ending ever. It digs deep into the psychology of someone who is grieving, who can't make the right judgment, who doesn't seem to know right from wrong. Because all she wants to know is something beyond anybody. The fear of being alone, the feeling of shame, and the paranoia of a purpose. All in all, it's very difficult to talk about Asai's filmography as a whole because they're so different from one another. They are also so divisive, I mean your top 5 can easily be someone else's bottom 5. But I think there's one element that pierces through all of his work, and it is the fact that they are raw. They are naked, metaphorically and literally. Asayas tends to use long lenses and follow the character's movement as he focuses on the daily action of our lives. Asayas' films can be sexy, they can be exploitative, they can be exciting, they can be calm, they can be mysterious, they can also be very at the moment. But above all, Asayas is more interested in capturing a feeling. To be honest with you, after watching a lot of the Asayas films, I don't even remember what happened in a number of them. However, I do remember how I feel when watching them. And I think that's the best way to describe who Asai is as a filmmaker. What is interesting in any art form, and especially in film, is more the 
more questioning reality uh, rather than finding uh, answers. And I think that questioning also means uh, dealing with ambivalence, with dealing with contradiction. I think any kind of uh, um, uh, any, any kind of path of understanding the modern world has to be dialectic in a way or another. So it has to include one thing and the other. Right? The, the movies don't function with clear answers. You keep 